Welcome back, folks. In this mini lecture, we're going to be thinking about object names. Now, bearing in mind the Whorfian hypothesis, that is the idea that the language we speak may influence subtle aspects of our cognition, perception, or understanding of the world. Uh, object names allow us one form of insight into the way that language acts as an interface between us and things in our environment. I'm going to start with a very simple example here. Uh, and this is an example that is shared across many human communities. The idea that uh, kinship relationships can be classified in a variety of ways. So I've mapped out a kind of family tree. What you can see in the middle here is a little person in green that represents you when you're thinking about your relationships to other members of your family. Next to you is someone you can think of as your spouse. Now I haven't specified uh, genders here for anyone because that will depend on you and your spouse. But in a canonical family tree, uh, when we look at the patterns of inheritance that are commonest around the world, we know that an individual may have older or younger siblings of either of the commonest genders. Those older or younger siblings uh, may have a spouse with whom they produce their own offspring. Those offspring may be older or younger and of different genders as well. Among these siblings, uh, who are at the same generational level as yourself, uh, you may come from some parents who themselves have older and younger siblings. And that whole sibling tier itself comes from a grandparent tier as well. Now your parents, older and younger siblings may also produce their own children who are older and younger and different genders. So you can see that the way a classical family tree can be comprised has many different possibilities for all of these individuals. Uh, and I'm going to talk very briefly about how my variety of English carves up this semantic space, because it's probably quite different from the way that your variety does. So here is a very terrible drawing of the linguistic system in my productive uh, vocabulary around now. Now, let me tell you that this is a work in progress because every time I learn a new word, I might refine the way I think about the members of my family. Uh, and it's possible for an individual to change. So what I want to mark out here is that other than children who I may one day produce of my own, uh, there is an entire tier of other children who regardless of which part or which branch of my or my spouse's family they come from, these are all nieces and nephews. Now you'll notice that niece and nephew are specified for gender, uh, but there is no specification for whether they're older or younger and no specification for which branch of the family they come from, whether they are in-laws or coming from my own uh, nuclear family itself. I have one categorical structure for siblings, which can be specified by gender, so brother or sister. And then I have one tier for the spouses of those people that regardless of which side, are simply listed as brother or sister in law. So what this means is that my husband's sister and my brother's wife have exactly the same name. Well, they would have the same name, except in my family, my brother and his partner have been together 20 years and never married. So I call her my sister outlaw instead. At this tier of same age relatives who are the same age as my brothers and sisters, but who are the children of my mother's or my father's siblings, these are all cousins, regardless of gender, 
regardless of whether they're older or younger and regardless of whether they come from my mother's or my father's side. We have gender specific labels for mums and dads. We have gender specific labels uh, for aunts and uncles, regardless of the side of the family. And we have gender specific labels for uh, the grandparent tier. So we have grandmothers and grandfathers. However, there's such a wide variety of grandparent names available that in my variety of English, every grandparent just chooses one they like and they decide to be known by that. And when, within each individual family, uh, no two grandparents have the same name as each other. When we look at my spouse's family over here, my spouse might have older or younger siblings who, again, because they're at this uh, same age tier as siblings for me, they are brothers or sisters-in-law. Uh, my spouse's parents are my mother and father-in-law, but we never use those names. We simply refer to them by their personal names. And I have no active kinship terms for any of these individuals in the extended family on that side. So what I'm trying to show you here is that different elements within this system can be specified with more or less detail. And uh, to share with you some of the features that may be obligatory in a kinship system. So let's look at what obligatory marking might look like. So again, this is referring to my own variety of English. The obligatory features seem to be gender, but not for cousins, generation for the hierarchy in the family tree. There seems to be a discrepancy between blood or marriage relatives, but it's not really specified at all levels in this system. It's not really specified uh, for aunts and uncles. In fact, instead, we use given names for aunts and uncles much more frequently. We use given names for cousins almost all of the time. Uh, and some uh, grandparents will choose to be known by their family name or some other nickname. Non-obligatory features are seniority among siblings, seniority among parent siblings, seniority within my own sibling tier relative to my own age or relative to my cousins. The maternal or paternal side of the family when it comes to aunts, uncles and grandparents, marriage relationships among aunts and uncles, marriage relationships for the siblings of my spouse. And we have no name for the spouse of a niece or a nephew or a spouse's distant relatives. And I'm gonna point you to this little blue box down the bottom to remind you that although we often think about kinship as very fixed, something that's very culturally important and therefore immutable, in my variety of English, there are a few different terms that have been sneaking in recently. The first is gunkle for a gay uncle. The second is nifflings or nibblings for nieces and nephews without specifying gender, which is kind of a calc on siblings. And the third is the one I already mentioned, this sister outlaw for unmarried uh, family members holding that same role, but without the legal paperwork that one might expect. So there are a couple of things we can observe here. The first is that linguistic systems that are shared among a community may differ from the different from the dictionary definitions of the roles that are expected within a kinship system. The second thing that we can observe here is that kinship systems may be subject to change over time as social patterns or relationship structures change. So for one of your class activities, you're gonna be interrogating kinship structures among your own linguistic variety. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see what you think are obligatory and non-obligatory marking within your community. When it comes to the naming conventions in Mandarin Chinese, we know that there is a rich vocabulary available. 
However, what I want you to think about in this example is the active vocabulary you have going for you in day-to-day -day language use. Not the one in the books, not the one your teachers drilled you on when you were sitting in your language classes, but what are the labels that you use for your family members when you meet them or when you talk about them and with different members of your family? Do you use the same labels all of the time? Do you use different versions of these labels in different contexts? Uh, so maybe you have family members who, when you are discussing them with your Mandarin speaking friends, you use the Mandarin label for their position in your family. But when you're discussing them with your family, you might be using a Hokkien expression instead. How do you say the names of the people in your family is an important part of how you represent the names of the people in your family. I'd also like you to think about whether there are some family members for whom you don't use this traditional system. Do you use an English name or a nickname or something else entirely? Do you call uh, your cousins cuz? Do you call your brother bro? Do you use personal names instead of these naming conventions? And does it differ depending on the occasion? So maybe you use these words correctly when there's a red packet involved. Or maybe you use these words correctly all the time. This is the territory that we're interested in for this exercise. So I want to take us one step back and remind us why are we asking this question about usage patterns and words um, when we could just look in a dictionary and say, well, Chinese does it like this. The Wharfian hypothesis tells us that language the language that an individual uses, the language that an individual has repeated exposure to through their use of that language. Language may bias us in certain ways to think about the world in certain structures that are linguistically encoded, but only if we use those linguistic structures. So it does not matter if a word or a definition is in a dictionary. If you do not use it, then it cannot influence your cognition. And this is why we are taking some time to come to terms with idiolectial variation. So that is the variation at the unit of one human speaker of a language, the idiolect. So I look forward to finding out what you and your groups discuss. Bearing in mind, I do not want a simple list of dictionary definitions of people names. I want your lived experience of being on the inside of this language. Which of these words are active in your language use day to day? And which are the words that you require external support for from your family members? So I look forward to seeing what you guys discover. Uh, and what patterns of language use are shared among our community. Do bear in mind that um, this linguistic description work is not valid simply for Mandarin Chinese. It does not matter what your language background is. You can still do an interrogation of a family tree for who you call what on what uh, circumstances. So I'll be excited to learn about all of your different uh, naming conventions for kinship. And that's the end of our tiny snippet on kinship.